Hi, I'm Patricia with Buzz and Bark Animal Reiki, and today I'm going to talk about animal anxiety. Well, I, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't really use that word, but separation anxiety, because it happens... Well, I'm just going to be focusing on dogs, because I haven't seen it in other animals, but I'm sure it's probably there with cats and other creatures as well. But the dog anxiety, separation anxiety is something that I have experienced many times in my life, not usually directly with the pets that I have in my care, but with neighboring pets, like if I was in an apartment house or when I've been staying in hotels, I've noticed this quite a lot, and actually just recently I've noticed it. And because I can do Reiki, I just sit down in whatever hotel room I'm in and I'll just do some Reiki. I don't send it, you know, I don't have permission to work with the animal directly, so I just send out the Reiki, and if the animal requests it, the animal will accept it. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It's up to the animal to decide and also once they've already in that frenzy, once they're already reached that crescendo, it's harder to calm them down through energy healing. It's not that it can't bring it down a notch, but it doesn't usually resolve the problem. You need to sort of nip it in the bud when it first starts. And um, I was, so I was in a hotel and I just got there, right? I just got into my hotel room and I heard a dog just howling like the top of his or her lungs. I don't really know uh, whether the dog was male or female and I could feel the anguish ex you know extremely strong and it, the dog was uh, throwing itself or her himself against a wall and then I was hearing this thud like on the floor and I was just hearing all kinds of scrambling and I'm like oh my gosh I hope that dog's not like tearing the place up because it was pretty crazy I mean not the dog but the situation and so I, you know, I was hungry and I would rather have just like taken a shower and eaten and just relaxed. But I just, because, you know, of the training with Reiki, I feel like if you're called to help, then that's what you do. And so I just put everything down and I washed my hands and then I just um, put on some calming music, uh, the Calm the Canine music on the um, YouTube channels. And I played that in the background and then I sent some Reiki and it didn't work. Like it maybe paused the dog for a few moments, but then the dog started howling again. And the anguish in this animal was just, ex like I said, it was extreme. It made me almost like getting tears in my eyes. And then there was another time just a week before where I did go, I was in the same room actually, the same hotel room and right next door were two dogs. And they started going into the separation anxiety as soon as the people left. And because it was the beginning of it, I sent Reiki and the dogs calmed down and I didn't hear them howling and I, it was completely quiet until their people came back and then of course got excited because their people were back. And then it was quiet again. So sometimes it works. I've also seen animals get into my peripheral vision and come into my full vision as if they want to get noticed. So I think those two dogs, I think they were German Shepherds, but I'm not absolutely sure because there was somebody who had two German Shepherds, but there was another lady who had two Collies, uh, both herding dogs, and herding dogs tend to have separation anxiety. And I recommend working with a trainer, especially if it's somebody's first pet, or if it's a rescue animal, or if it's a young dog, like a puppy. Because one of the things that puppies suffer from is to be taken away from their mother. Now, most uh, good breeders will wait after eight weeks to do that. Because the mother dog, according to Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, the mother dog actually does most of the training as far as socialization. So the longer you can keep the puppies with the mother dog, now I know it's probably not cost effective for breeders, which is probably why they try to sell them immediately. However, if they can stay over eight weeks, you know, to a certain point, they're going to get more socialization. It's not a strain for the mother dog to have the puppies there. The mother dog knows what she needs to do. She's instinctual. She actually loves being with her puppies, uh, most of them, and there are probably some dogs that don't want to be a mother. However, a lot of the rescue dogs that had puppies would actually mourn when their puppies were either taken away or if something happened to the puppies or if the puppy got injured, you would see these mother dogs in the videos uh, trying to get somebody to come over and save their puppy. So there is a bond between the mother animals and their, their babies, as there would be with humans. So when the puppy is taken away from the mother, say even 12 weeks, there is a separation that happens at that point. 
and that dog needs to now bond with another caregiver and that takes time so if somebody were to adopt a puppy and then immediately go on a trip and either leave that dog with a dog sitter or to take the dog and leave the dog in a hotel that dog is going to suffer from um, separation anxiety because it needs to in its and this is from more of an animal communication this is not psychology i do not do dog behavior or training or psychology so this is from what animals have told me and what i pick up as a communicator animals well we're talking dogs here dogs miss their mothers and so if you can remember when you were a little child and say you were taken to daycare for the first time or you were taken to a kindergarten now when i went to kindergarten i had separation anxiety from my mother and so i get triggered even now in my 50s i get triggered when a child starts crying when their mother leaves them or if an animal starts crying because their person their caregiver leaves them now i'm not judging the caregivers of these animals i'm not judging the humans but there has to be some sort of training that needs to happen did i just say happen twice to get that animal safe and peaceful for any separation that's going to happen so if the people are going to be going to work or they're going to be uh, like taking the dog on vacation or leaving the dog in the hotel they have to remember that okay one the dog is in a strange environment they don't recognize the smells two if they've only had the dog for a short while which is what happened with the dog last night that dog has not adjusted to knowing and trusting that his or her people are going to return and if the dog came from a shelter then that dog has had at least two separations one from the mother dog and then two from the shelter or actually being taken to a shelter is another separation so whoever had the dog that took the dog to the shelter or if the dog had been stray and then it goes to a shelter that dog has had to adjust to these situations and we as humans just expect them to be flexible and to get on with it because we get on with it but you have to understand that animals are much more sensitive to we are and even sensitive human beings they're more sensitive even to the most sensitive of human beings so even the empathic human being is not as sensitive as an animal so the dog has the ability to adjust and to be flexible i mean most dogs do but if they have been traumatized or if they took the separation from their mother or going to a shelter or whatever if they've taken that as trauma then they're going to be triggered when they get left behind and so it's going to take a lot of reassurance and again hiring a dog trainer or a behaviorist or somebody that is going to work with that dog and help that dog prepare for being left alone especially in a strange environment so they start with leaving it in the home right so you bond with the animal first and then you start leaving them for short amount of times and then longer amount of times and so on but it's best i think to work with a trainer unless the person getting the dog is a certified trainer or they've had some training as a trainer because everybody assumes that just because they can get a dog and they had a dog as a childhood then they know everything about a dog but most of us don't know enough about dogs i mean there's more books coming out all the time that are telling us about how the dog brain works how the dog sensory works that we didn't know 10 years ago or 20 years ago or even five years ago so it also helps to read those books you know to be a novice to be to recognize that we're naive that we don't understand these other species and to learn everything we can about them now that's the best people for dogs or any pet are the ones that are constantly learning lifelong learners take an animal um, first aid class take an animal cpr class learn about what is not healthy for an animal and you know what can potentially kill them you know not that you should live in fear and you know and completely proof your house to the point where you can't actually live in it anymore that's not what we're saying it's just that having a pet is a huge responsibility and there is a lot of pressure right now to adopt dogs out of shelters but we still have to be ready for that 
and we have to understand that there's going to be a lot of work with that dog. You can't just adopt the dog out of a shelter and go to work the next day because that dog is going to have some issues. You may come home and find that your couch has been ripped up and that your walls are torn up. And, um, you know, this can happen during separation anxiety. They could poop all over the house. They could pee all over the house. It's not their fault. They're petrified. They're afraid they've been abandoned. They're also pack animals, and that's something to remember. Animals want to be in their, I mean, dogs want to be in their pack. Some animals are loners, but dogs are not loners. Dogs want to be in their pack. They want to belong in a group. They want a family, and you may be a single person, and you are their family. And so they're going to bond, and they're going to be very loyal. They're going to be very committed, but you also need to be loyal to them, and you need to be committed to them. And that commitment is the amount of work it's going to take to help that animal feel reassured when you leave that you're going to be returning. And also, if you work an eight-hour day, make sure that you have somebody to come in maybe halfway through the day to walk the dog or to make sure the dog's got enough water to drink and make sure it has some kind of companionship in the middle of the day. Now, some people will get another dog to help, you know, the dogs not be lonely, and I don't know how well that works. You know, I guess it depends on the people, and they could tell you their stories of whether it works or not. But they're bonding to the human first before they're bonding to another dog. And at least this is what I've noticed. And so if you're the human, then you can, if you have a flexible job, if you can work at home, that's the best way to go. If you can't work at home and you have long hours, you might decide not to get a dog at all. Because people that are away 8 to 12 hours, that's, that's tough for an animal. And I know when I was growing up, you know, I went to school for, what, five hours a day, and my parents worked eight-hour days, and so the animals would be at home by themselves all day, and I don't think that was good for them, because they would run away, and we had one dog that kept walking to the pound or going to the pound, and we had to keep going and getting the dog out of the pound, because they knew how to get over the fence. Well, dogs get bored, too. So if you're not going to be home during the day and you don't have somebody else that can come in and be with the dog, like a friend or a dog walker or maybe even a pet sitter that can come in maybe a couple hours a day, like in the middle of the day, to give that dog companionship, then at least have some puzzles or um, those toys where you put food inside and it takes them a long time to get the food out or you know give them uh, something to do. Don't leave them out in the yard for eight hours or two hours, you know, while you're away because they can um, easily overheat or they can freeze if it's a cold place. It's just not comfortable for, you know, dogs to be left out um, for long periods of time, especially if that dog had been a stray and, you know, you're leaving the dog outside for several hours. That dog is going to remember the trauma of being a stray. At least this is what I pick up as an animal communicator. Because even when I'm not doing a session, a session with a dog, I'm walking around and people are walking past me with their dogs and their dogs are communicating with me whether I want them to or not. They're usually like a little snippet. Sometimes I'll see a little movie of the dog's life. Sometimes I'll pick up a big emotion from them. Other times I'll pick up something that they're disgruntled about. If you think dogs don't rant, think again because I've heard some of these rants, <laughs> and it's usually about their situation or their circumstances. Because we spoil dogs in the wrong ways. We don't give them what they want. We give them what we think they want as if they were humans. So there are the people who will buy their dogs like tons of little dolly clothing. That's not what the dog wants. The dog will do whatever it needs to do to please the human. Then sometimes they'll bite the human because they don't want those things. You know, they'll give us warnings for sure. They want, you know, if you listen to Caesar Milan again, they want a lot of exercise. They want to be fed, not overfed, because if you overfeed a dog, it becomes obese, and obesity is really dangerous for a dog, can lead to an early death and all kinds of problems. You know, it's the same with humans. You know, if you have overweight humans, they have a lot of health conditions. Same with the animals. So if you don't want a lot of big vet bills, Feed your dog as much as it needs to be fed and don't give them a bunch of extra food and certainly don't feed them a bunch of human junk food. Just That's a no-no right there. That's irresponsible. And I've seen what can happen to a dog when that happens. I mean, they can gain weight faster than we can. So a small dog like a Datsun, five pounds on a dog like that or five pounds on a Chihuahua is overweight, like extremely overweight. Uh, 10 pounds on a 30-pound dog, you know, or the dog that I was taking care of, he was 55 pounds overweight at one point. 
and even 60 pounds, I believe, at one point. He was supposed to be 55 to 60 pounds, and he was 115 at one point. So that's what happens when you feed dogs junk food because you think that you're doing them a favor. You think that that's the way to love them. Don't love a dog through food. Find other ways to love them because a lot of that's gonna to lead to separation anxiety too. Like if you're over spoiling the dog, you're not giving them what they need for their brain stimulation and for their physical stimulation and for their physical exercise, their brain exercises. If you're not feeding them in that way, then they're gonna overeat, then they're gonna be destructive. So again, they need a lot of exercise. It doesn't matter if it's a Yorkie or if it's a German short hair pointer, they all need whatever amount of exercise they need. So taking a dog in a stroller when it's a young dog, you know, you can walk a Yorkie for a couple blocks or however far they wanna walk or take them to the dog park and let them run around. But putting them in a stroller and going around the block, that's not an exercise for the dog. That's just insane. So if the dog has an impediment, like they're elderly or they have um, some health condition where they can't go for a walk and you take them in a stroller, then okay, I get it. But I've seen perfectly healthy dogs rolling around in a stroller dressed up like dolls. That's not a dog. They, people who are doing that, they might as well just get a doll. They might as well get a stuffed animal because in my opinion, that's insanity. That's not the way you treat a dog. So. A lot of the problems that dogs have are because of human behavior. And so I have met a lot of responsible dog owners and I'd say that a good majority of them are responsible, but I have also seen some things that just make me cringe. And I can't say anything to people because it's kind of none of my business, but the animals will communicate with me about what they really want. And you know, if you think a dog in a stroller dressed up like a doll is not miserable, they're miserable. They don't like it. They wanna be dogs. They wanna smell like a dog. They wanna be around other dogs. They wanna do the things that dogs do. They wanna sniff things. They wanna pee on things. You know, they wanna leave their scent behind. They want to run. They want to, um, you know, be part of the pack. And they wanna eat, you know, but what they need to eat, which is, you know, giving them the vitamins that they need so that they're not going to be hungry all day. Because it's just like with humans. If we don't get the minerals and vitamins that we need, we'll just be hungry all day. And it doesn't matter how many bags of chips we eat. We will not be fulfilled because we're not getting the fiber and the vitamins and the minerals that we need, which causes the brain to stop and say, okay, you're satiated. So with a lot of the stuff that's out there, especially the genetically modified junk food, don't give it to your dog. Okay, and I think most of the people listening to this would never do that, but you may know other people that are doing it and um, it's not a good idea. It's gonna lead to a, some huge vet bills or an early death to that poor animal and they don't deserve that. They're not here to die a painful death. And speaking of painful deaths, the last two things I'm gonna talk about are I'm seeing a lot of, it's hot where I am, okay? I'm in Vermont, it's been in the 90s and people are still driving around with the dogs in the cars. And today I saw a dog that was already showing the signs that it's close to getting a heat stroke. It was doing the trembling, and I only saw it for a few seconds because the car drove past me and I looked at this dog and I picked up a message from the dog and the dog was doing that out of context yawning thing where it's a discomfort. And if that dog were to stay in that hot car for a few more moments or whatever. Hopefully they took the dog out and walked the dog, but it's really hot outside and that means that the pavement is hot so the dog's gonna possibly burn his pads, his paw pads on the hot asphalt or the um, sidewalk. You know, it's best to go on grass or you know, go to an area that's earth instead of the cement. So I'm just seeing a lot of things like that and for me it's, it's tragic. It doesn't have to happen and I've seen dogs left in cars like it's hot and the people go into the store and the dog is in a parking lot, they're not in the shade, the windows are cracked, but that car is, is like 20 degrees hotter than what is outside of the car. I think it's 20 degrees. So if it's 90 degrees outside or 96 degrees, then it's probably like 120 degrees in that car. That dog is not gonna survive that. And so these are things that I have noticed and I'm really shocked that in this day and age with all the information out there on dogs and safety and health care and holistic health and all the rest of that 
that people are still doing this. Or the dogs hanging out the window while the car's going like 40 miles an hour down a highway. Bad idea. And I've talked about all of this before, but if you know anybody who's doing that, you're going to have to stand up to them. You're going to have to find a diplomatic way of telling them that what they're doing is dangerous. And some people are even saying that there's restraining things that you can keep the dog like straight. I mean, it, like they can still, I guess, put their head out the window or whatever, but they're, um, they have like these straps or whatever that holds them in so that they don't fly out the window if there's a sudden, um, kind of like us with seat belts. The only other thing that can happen to though, with if a dog is in a car that's moving fast, the uh, when the car goes over like dirt or rocks or whatever, this can hit the dog's eyes. The dirt can get in the dog's eyes and it can cause all kinds of um, problems with the eyes or it could um, hurt the nose or hurt the mouth or hurt the head of the dog. So these are things to be wary of. These are things that we forget because dogs are so cute. They're so adorable. You know, there's all the videos on them. There's a lot of movies that have dogs in them. Dogs are very trendy right now. But there's a lot that people need to know when they're going to get a dog in their life and to research all of it before even bringing that dog in their house. And, you know, make sure there's not poison sitting around. Make sure you're not spraying stuff on your lawn and then your dog's rolling in like herbicide or pesticides. You know, just make sure that that place is safe and that the inside is the inside of the house is safe, that you're not using any types of uh, chemicals or even aromatherapy oils that could harm the dog because their scent is much stronger than ours or more sensitive than we are. They have very sensitive nervous systems. And I'm just talking about dogs in this video and maybe another one I'll do some research and I'll talk about cat safety. But you can also go on YouTube and you can find all this information that I've just talked about. There are many people who are experts, who are trainers, behaviorists, holistic vets, you know, they're all on YouTube and you can go watch as many of those videos as possible and then you can journal, keep a list of, you know, um, make improvements because we all make mistakes. It's not that we beat ourselves up. It's just that we want these animals to live as long as they possibly can. And we want them to live a healthy, happy life. So that should be the goal. And I think they want that too. And, you know, they're committed to you. They're loyal. They trust your judgment. But then there's things that they need and there's and there's safety things that they need as well. So thank you for listening again. I'm Patricia with Buzz and Bark Animal Reiki. I do remote animal Reiki for animals, which is distance Reiki. I also do animal communication with any animal in the world. All I need is a picture and of course we do the intake. That's a little bit more difficult if you're eight, ten hours ahead of me or behind me. However, I can do MP3s. I uh, usually try to do a Zoom call at the beginning to do the intake and go over, you know, it's about 30 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes, and then I get off the phone, and then we schedule the time where the dog is like, you know, resting somewhere, and then I do either the Reiki session at the time or the animal communication, depending on what it is you want. I also, when I get set up in my own home again, I'm going to have my um, sound therapy available. I also do angelic therapy. All these are available for both humans and animals. And again, I do it all remotely. It works. And then one thing you do need to remember is if your animal is getting a Reiki treatment or animal communication, make sure they have some fresh water uh, available for them all day long because they're going to be thirsty because it's an energy exchange. And energy's exchange can heat up the body and it can make you very thirsty and dehydrated. So I want to thank you again for being here. I hope that you will sign up for a session. If not, please subscribe to this channel. Again, Buzz and Bark Animal Reiki, so that as humans can bond more deeply with our pets. Thank you.